It's late January 2022, and I'm outside of Tucson taking the new truck on its very first shakedown run in the backcountry. If you're just now following along, the new truck is in fact not so new. It's a 1991 Land Rover Defender 110 high capacity pickup. I've been driving it around all day, and I feel like I'm quickly getting used to the right hand drive and shifting with my left. Initially, I wasn't very good at that, and I still have a decent amount of practice ahead of me. First of all, my very first reaction, putting it in low range four wheel drive with the center diff lock on, is that it's right at home on primitive tracks. that rattle. The Arizona desert seems like an unlikely landscape for this truck that probably spent most of its life in the English countryside. This week, with the help of Sonoran Rovers, we're working toward getting the truck adventure ready. And as you can see, we're almost there. They're still looking over things mechanically to make sure that all systems are rock solid or as rock solid as they can be for a 30 year old vehicle with 198,000 miles on it. Because the plan is to do some exploring in the truck here in the Southwest. And then as temperatures warm up, drive it up to the Pacific Northwest to pick up my Jeep. Since last week, the truck now has a locking center console between the two front seats. The rubbish seat covers are gone. It now has USB outlets to charge my GPS navigation, camera batteries. The latching mechanism on both doors have been shored up, so now the doors open and close better, and they also seal better. And I think tomorrow they're going to install aluminum boxes in the bed for my gear and a 48 inch high lift jack against the bed rail here.
buddy. Shannon's off on a business trip for a couple nights, so it's just me and Finnegan in the van in the back country outside of Tucson. And I got a wonderful campsite beneath some towering saguaro cacti. I got here a little bit late tonight after spending much of the day at Sonoran Rovers getting some work done on the truck. I had to prioritize lockable weatherproof storage compartments in the bed because I desperately needed a safe and secure place to put a lot of my camping gear, camera equipment, electronics. The two passenger Defender 110 high cap has practically no room for cargo in the cab so I needed a solution for the bed and those Argus boxes are going to do really nicely. Anyway this spot is a really beautiful desert setting accessible by any vehicle and I can't wait to share it with you in the morning. While we really like the concept of this accordion style electric kettle for how compact and easy it is, it's really cheaply made and of poor quality. This is our second one. We had to replace our first one because it ruptured. I would love to find a kettle like this that's better made. Hey Siri, set timer for five minutes. Five minutes, starting now. Over the holidays, I upgraded one of my most essential tools. You'd think that the vehicle or camping equipment or sleeping platform might be the most essential tool. That's not the case. It is definitely a tablet running Gaia GPS for navigation. For about a half a dozen years, I don't know, it was a really long time, I ran an iPad Mini 4 on my dashboard running Gaia GPS. However, toward the end of its run, it started getting really slow. It was having trouble rendering maps on Gaia GPS. It would take a long time to draw tracks, to render waypoints. So over the holidays, I upgraded my iPad Mini 4 to the recently released iPad Mini 6, and it's brilliant. My iPad Mini 4 was Wi-Fi only, no cell service, and that means that it wasn't equipped with a GPS chip. So the iPad alone couldn't identify my location via GPS. To use my old iPad as a GPS, I tethered it to my Garmin and Reach via Bluetooth. And this became the GPS receiver that would send my position data to the iPad. Now this worked really well for a long time, and if you do not have a GPS-enabled tablet, this could work well for you too. A Bluetooth connection from your GPS to your tablet. Now with this iPad Mini 6, I purchased a cellular-enabled version, so it has the GPS built into it, and I no longer need to tether it to my GPS. One thing that I really like that I can do now that I couldn't very well do before with my older iPad just because of a lack of horsepower and a lack of connectivity is I can split screen Gaia GPS with Google Maps or Google Earth. The split screen on a tablet is not a new feature but my old iPad was so slow that it was having enough trouble running Gaia GPS alone so I didn't take advantage of it until now. 
It's really perfect for my old Land Rover because now I don't need to find mounting and charging locations for a multitude of devices. Having two displays, one that shows your position over a topographical map and the other that shows your position over satellite imagery is invaluable. The topographical map will show you where you can go and the satellite imagery will show details of the features around you. You'll be able to see if there might be a campsite up ahead. You can often see the fire circle as a little ring and a clearing. If you're interested in Gaia GPS, I firmly believe that it is the best GPS solution out there for reading the terrain and backcountry discovery, and I've got a link in the description for this video. All right, the truck is in the shop getting pampered a little bit more. What do you say we take the van out and do some exploring? Another really great campsite tonight. I just left the van to go for a stroll and I ended up hiking about a mile up to the top of the saddle. The footpath continues down the other side, but I'm going to turn around right here because I didn't expect to go for a hike. So I don't have water or anything. It was one of those things where I was curious and I just kept telling myself a little bit further, a little bit further. But as you can see, the hike up here was very much worth it.
It's fair to ask, which vehicle do I like best for full-time overland adventure and backcountry exploration? Of course, for over four years, I've lived almost exclusively in my orange 2013 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited, equipped with an Ursa Minor J30 camper. I've spent a ton of time in that Jeep, and over the years, I feel like I've really got it dialed in perfectly. RNG will get it done. If you want to drive 100 miles off grid and set up camp on the top of a mountain in the Jeep, you can do that. The Land Rover 110 that I just got, which I'm looking at on my screen right now, is a completely different experience and it's still very new to me. Being an older vehicle, a 1991, it's going to take a different level of care than the Jeep, than the Revel. I'm still settling into the truck, but I can say right off the bat that it makes me smile big time. I love to look at it, I love the rattle of the diesel engine, and it's a lot of fun to drive in the backcountry. Now, from a practicality standpoint, the thing that fuels my fire more than anything is travel and mobile living. And the vehicle that enables us to do that with minimal discomfort and minimal fatigue is the Winnebago Revel. It's a bonus that this particular RV has some semblance of four-wheel drive capability, but of all the vehicles, this one is the most stressful to drive around in the backcountry. That's because a lot's at stake and I still have 19 years worth of RV payments left. So there's the downside to that. However, if your aim is to live comfortably on the road or in the backcountry, I would seriously look at a van first, particularly a four-wheel drive capable one. I'm gonna call that a wrap for the week and start editing video. Just a reminder that GPS data for this episode is available to Patreon subscribers. As usual, thanks for following along and I'll catch up with you again next week.